Okay, what we're going to do is take a look at some more reactions and specifically what we're going to do is show you how to determine if a single replacement and or a double replacement reaction happens. So while you're doing this, you might want to have your activity series and your solubility rules present. So let's get right into it and let's start talking about how we determine if these reactions happen. The first thing we want to do is talk about um, the activity series. Okay, an activity series is basically a listing of metals and sometimes you'll even see them with non-metals but basically it's a listing of metals that will identify which metals will replace which in a single replacement reaction. So for example, let's say we're talking about magnesium reacting with sodium chloride. We know that we can write the reaction here as magnesium chloride and sodium, but what this activity series will tell you is if the metal that's going to replace the metal in the compound to form the new compound is strong enough to replace that metal. So what you do is you look at the metal that's doing the replacing, in this case it's magnesium, and it has to be higher than the thing it's replacing on the activity series. So for example, magnesium here is actually lower on the activity series than the thing that it's trying to replace. So this reaction would not happen. On the other hand, if we wrote the reaction in the reverse order, in other words, sodium reacts with magnesium chloride to form sodium chloride and magnesium. Now the sodium is trying to replace the magnesium. Sodium is higher than magnesium on the chart, so this reaction would take place. So when you're looking at single replacement reactions, you're using this thing that we call an activity series. If you're looking at double replacement reactions, what you need to use is a chart that refers to the solubility rules. We'll talk a little bit more about solubility after we do some examples of single replacement, but this is your listing of solubility rules. So, for example, if a compound contains the polyatomic nitrate, we know that those are soluble without any exceptions. So, for example, sodium nitrate would be soluble. On the other hand, if you had, say, something uh, like let's say copper to carbonate. Carbonate compounds are insoluble, the exceptions being the group 1A and ammonia compounds. So copper carbonate would be insoluble, but sodium carbonate, since it is a group 1 metal carbonate, would be soluble. Uh, well, again, we'll discuss this a little bit more after when we do some examples. All right, let's take a look at some of the examples. And the thing to remember, the thing to remember about doing these reactions is if you are doing a single replacement reaction, you're going to use your activity series. If we're talking about a double replacement reaction, you're going to use your solubility rules. That's really important because people who are doing single replacement reaction react, reactions tend to look at the solubility rules and you don't need to. So single replacement reaction, use your activity series. Double replacement, use your solubility rules. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the examples here. Um, let's write the reaction first. We've got sodium metal and that's reacting with copper 2 sulfide and once again it, you have to be able to write formulas. We've talked about this a number of times. So if we were going to write the formula for this, or the products for this, sodium is replacing the copper and forming a compound with the sulfur. So we're going to have sodium sulfide and copper. We could balance it, so we have two sodiums, two sodiums, and our coppers and coppers are good. So now what we need to do is determine would this reaction happen. So 
what you have to do is look at the thing that's doing the replacing. Is it higher on the activity series than copper? So we want to look at sodium, which is sodium, which is here, and our copper is down there. So clearly sodium is higher than copper on the activity series, so that reaction would happen. Again, you're looking at the thing that's doing the replacing, comparing it to the thing that it's replacing. So let's look at the next one. We have magnesium reacting with potassium hydroxide. The compound, or the, I keep calling them the compounds, they are compounds, but the products for that reaction are going to be magnesium hydroxide and potassium. So now you've got the magnesium replacing the potassium. So if we look on our activity series, what we're looking at is where magnesium is placed versus where potassium is placed. And you'll notice that potassium is near the top of the activity series. So when we look at our reaction, when we look at our reaction, since potassium is higher than magnesium on the activity series, that means that this reaction would not happen because magnesium is not strong enough to replace the potassium. Okay, let's take a look at two more. We have zinc, or I'm sorry, it says silver. We have silver reacting with zinc nitrate so the products would be silver nitrate and zinc so we have to see if silver is higher than zinc on the activity series so again we go back to our activity series and we see that silver is way down here Zinc is way up higher, so zinc is higher than the silver on the activity series. So if zinc is higher than silver on the activity series, that means that this reaction would not happen. So we would say no reaction. The next one, we have hydrochloric acid reacting with hydrogen. So HCl reacts with N2. Now we've got a nonmetal as the single element and here's our compound. Now we won't do too many of these so when what you have to do is look at your activity series and determine is nitrogen higher than chlorine on the activity series. So we would have H3N plus Cl2 and again when we go back to our activity series we're comparing nitrogen to chlorine and nitrogen is not on our activity series for the nonmetals, so we will simply skip that one. All right, now let's take a look at the double replacement reactions. For the double replacement reactions, we have to use the subscripts that we have seen written in these reactions. The subscripts stand for solid, liquid, gas, and aqueous. All right. What you have to do is you have to use your solubility chart to determine if a compound is insoluble or soluble. And you might want to fast or rewind this a few times and make sure you get this. On your solubility chart, if the, if the solution is or if the compound is soluble, the compound is going to get the AQ designation afterwards. If the compound is insoluble, it is going to get the solid designation. Insoluble compounds form precipitates, which are solids. Soluble compounds are going to dissolve in the solution and break apart into their ions. So again, soluble compounds will form aqueous. Insoluble compounds will form solids. The liquids for us, for right now, the only liquid that we're going to use is H2O. And if you're curious, well, then what's the difference between something dissolved in water and water? It's just that. If something is dissolved in the water, you call it aqueous. 
If it's a pure liquid, we're going to call it H2O. Now there are plenty of other pure liquids other than H2O, but for now, we're going to say that H2O will get that designation L. Gases, as we talked about in class, we have H2, N2, O2, F2, and Cl2, and then car carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And again, there are plenty of other gases, but for now, those are the seven gases that we're going to use. So you've got to have your solubility chart handy um, to do, or you've got to know the solubility rules, to do the double replacement reactions. All right, so first of all, let's write out the reaction. All right, so let's take a look at our first reaction here. We've got silver nitrate, so let's write the formula for that. And that's reacting with sodium chloride. So the first thing we want to do is write the products for this reaction. We've got silver chloride and sodium nitrate. All right, now what we want to do is write our subscripts, the solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous for each of the compounds. So you've got to look at your solubility rules. And what you're going to see is that all nitrates are soluble. So that's going to get the designation AQ. Any group one metal is going to be soluble. So that's going to get our AQ designation. What you're going to see is chlorides are not, or they're insoluble. So if you look at your solubility chart, you can see on here you can see on here that your chlorides are soluble except silver chloride, mercury, or lead chloride. So silver chloride is going to be insoluble. So if we go back to our reaction, where did it go? If we go back to our reaction, silver chloride is insoluble, so it is going to get the designation solid. And again, all nitrates are, sol are soluble, so it's going to get the designation AQ. All right, the next step in this process, like we talked about, is you have to write the ionic equation. So what we're going to do is break apart the things that are aqueous into their ions. So the ions that make up sodium or silver nitrate are the silver ion and the nitrate ion. Sodium chloride is aqueous, so we're going to write sodium plus chloride. Now the silver chloride is solid, so it doesn't break apart into its ions, so we're going to leave it as AgCl. Sodium nitrate is aqueous, so we're going to write it as sodium ion and nitrate ion. All right, the next step in this process is determining what changes and what doesn't change. In other words, if you look at the nitrate as a reactant, it's an ion. As a product, it's an ion. So it doesn't change, so we're going to cross that out. We're not interested in that. On the other hand, the silver ion is an ion as a reactant, but as a product, it's part of a compound. So that changes. In other words, it goes from an ion to part of a compound. So we are going to write silver ion, and then we're going to include our silver chloride. Sodium is an ion as a reactant, as a product also, so it doesn't change. Chloride, on the other hand, is an ion, and again, it's part of a product, as a, a part of a compound as the product, so it does change, so we're going to include that. So what we have then, in the end, is what we refer to as the net ionic equation. And what it means is if you put these two compounds together, a reaction happens, and the reaction is the silver ion and the chloride come together to form the silver uh, chloride. So basically, to determine if a double replacement reaction happens, what you've got to do is determine your subscripts using your solubility rules. If all of them are aqueous, in other words, if all are aqueous, the reaction doesn't happen. If anything is not aqueous or uh, insoluble, then it does happen. So if something changes, in other words, we've produced a solid, then the reaction does happen. All right, this is a quick overview um, of this process. I think what I'm going to do 
Uh, sometime probably tomorrow is produce another vodcast and spend some time with uh, the double replacement reactions. But I'm going to post this one now in, in this form, and I think what I'll do is go back and touch it up a little bit.